Welcome to all again. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker, Dr. Cecilia Metal Santos, who is my colleague at the Center for Social Studies, a researcher at the Center for Social Studies. So I know her well, but I know that many of you may not know her work. So I would like to make a more formal presentation and of course thanking her for having accepted our invitation in the name of the Association of American Studies. So Cecilia McDonald Santos is besides a researcher, as I already mentioned, a professor of sociology at the University of San Francisco. So she made a long trip to be with us here. She holds a PhD in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley. And a Master's in Law from the University of São Paulo. At ZER, Cecilia is connected to the research group Democracy, Citizenship and Law, and she coordinates and holds teaching duties in the PhD program on human rights in contemporary societies. Her current research interests focus on the following subject areas discourses and practices on violence against women, and the legal mobilization of human rights at the local, national, and transnational levels. Regarding the former, she has studied the relations between the state, the criminal justice system, and the women's movements in Brazil, with a focus on laws and policies to confront domestic violence against women. And as uh, concerns the latter, she has focused on transnational mobilization practices for women's human rights, indigenous rights, and the right to political memory, especially in the context of Brazil and the inter-American system of human rights. <coughs> she has, in addition, analyzed the legal mobilization of human rights in the Portuguese and European contexts. <coughs> and to illustrate all this, her latest publications include, and I am really just making a very short selection, uh, in Portuguese, uh, for an, an intersectional approach of the law Maria da Penha, para uma abordagem interseccional da lei Maria da Penha, Legal Dualism and the Bipolar State, Challenges to Indigenous Human Rights in Brazil, Transitional justice from the margins, legal mobilization and memory politics in Brazil, and women's, pol women's police stations, gender violence and justice in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Her research has appeared in several renowned journals and books as well, and she is here today to speak to us about mobilizing human rights against reactionary politics on human rights, a very topical matter for sure. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, especially my colleagues at SEDS, Maria José Canelo and Isabel Caldeira, for the invitation uh, to give this lecture in, uh, at this uh, conference. Um, it is a great pleasure and an honor to be here. I'm actually coming from Brazil right now. I, I was in the United States, in San Francisco, but then I went to Brazil and just came from there. Um, the title of my talk, as uh, Maria José already mentioned, is Mobilizing Human Rights Against Reactionary Politics of Human, human Rights. I will draw on examples of mobilizing practice of human rights, particularly in Brazil and in the context of the inter-American system of human rights, which is uh, the research I have been conducting in the past years. Um, I would like to preface uh, this presentation by expressing my sorrow and indignation for the recent execution of Rio's council member, Marielle Franco, and her driver, Anderson Gomes. As you probably heard in the news, they were brutally killed a week ago, on March 14th, precisely a week ago, 
Uh, right after Marielle left an event, she had organized titled Jovens Negras Movendo as Estruturas, Young Black Women Changing Power Structures. Marielle was a black woman, lesbian or bisexual, some say, uh, from the poor and marginalized Maré community in Rio, a defender of black rights, black women and women's rights, LGBT rights, fighting against police violence and human rights violations of favela residents in Rio, and also defending the human rights of police officers killed in the so-called war on drugs undertaking by the Brazilian government. She was a member of the Partido Socialismo e Liberdade of Brazil, elected in 2016 for Rio's Council, receiving the fifth highest number of votes among 50 elected supervisors. I was in Brazil, as I mentioned, this past week, and closely followed the different reactions to her assassination in the country. Unfortunately, it's not the first execution of a radical human rights leader of color from marginalized communities, fighting against racial, class, gender, and environmental inequalities and injustice in Brazil and in the Americas, as we could see in the previous wonderful lecture presentation. Uh, Margarida Maria Alves, rural worker and union organizer in the northeast of Brazil, was killed in the early 1980s. Chico Mendes, environmental and union leader, was killed in 1989 in Acre, in the north of Brazil. Cacique Chicão, the chief leader of the indigenous uh, people Chukuru, was killed in 1998 just to cite a few uh, community leaders assassinated in Brazil. In the Americas, we, also, we have also witnessed several killings of leaders, just to remember Bertha Cáceres from Honduras, environmental indigenous activist, co-founder and coordinator of the Council of popular and indigenous organizations of Honduras. Like Berta Cáceres, the assassination of Marielle Franco immediately sparked a national and international wave of protests and visuals in her honor. In Brazil, by the morning after her death, at least 15 large cities had planted visuals. In Rio alone, more than 20,000 people were uh, gathering to honor her and also to protest this king. These protests and visuals spread to other cities in the Americas, including Buenos Aires, New York, and in Europe, here in Lisbon, Porto, and also in Paris, among other places. The Brazilian government recognized the gravity of the assassination of Maria Franco. Rede Globo, the largest TV network in the country, devoted 45 minutes of its fantastical weekly show last Sunday evening uh, to cover Marielle's assassination and her family's grief, including interviews with her daughter and her partner, a woman. However, as noted by journalist Glenn Greenwald from The Intercept, the show portrayed Marielle's politics as simply a human rights defender, decontextualizing her struggle and death from the ongoing police violence inflicted against the poor and black residents in the favelas of Rio. And quoting from him, the only segment describing Marielle's politics was an extremely banal condescending discussion of the definition of human rights, which Fantastico basically reduced to an uncontroversial declaration that all humans 
are born free and should be treated equally. Propositions that virtually every Brazilian politician, from right to left, would happily endorse. They drained Marielle's politics of its vibrancy, radicalism, and force, and converted it into a simplistic comic book of empty cliches that nobody would find objectionable. Marielle is strongly opposed the federal military intervention that since February 16 has prevailed over public security in the state of Rio. This intervention has granted the military the power to arrest and kill any suspect people, of drug dealing in the shanty towns of Rio, suspending constitutional and fundamental human rights of this subject. A few days before her murder, Marielle was appointed rapporteur of the Parliamentary Commission on Human Rights to monitor the military intervention. On February 28, the councilwoman published on her Facebook profile, we take a stand and are against this intervention. It is a force with electoral objectives. We will occupy this space the Commission, fulfilling our oversight role as a municipal legislator. One day, one day before she was executed, she protested on her Twitter account. Another murder of a young man at the hands of the military police, Mateus Melo, was leaving church. How many more will need to die for this war to end? The military intervention in Rio was the toughest measure of Michel Temer's government in the election year of 2018. It's clear that Mariela's death was a political crime, with the goal of silencing and stealing fear in those trying to denounce the grave human rights violations committed by police force or militias in Brazil. The military intervention only escalates this violent situation. It's clear that Brazil is under a permanent state of exception since the parliamentary coup that impeached former President Dilma Rousseff, elected democratically in 2015 and impeached in August 2016. What is unique about the current context is that human rights politics has gained different conflicting and apparently confusing narratives. In the last five or more years, we can see a reactionary movement taking over formal politics, the state. This movement is not new, but it has expanded, it has become more organized and it has effectively dismantled a few of the human rights advancements and counters um, that we can see in the Americas uh, and in Brazil in particular since the 1988 Brazilian Constitution in a process of democratization that now is going back. I identify four politics on human rights in this very confusing field. First, uh, I see what uh, has been the, the dominant or the hegemonic approach to human rights, a liberal perspective. <coughs> Historically, uh, this has centered on uh, individual rights, the promotion of individual <coughs> rights. That could be the, the light view on human rights portrayed by the global as well as President Temer. It's human rights from above. It it's goes well together with a new <coughs> politics. <coughs> or what Charles Hill calls a neoliberal multiculturalism. In the 1990s, Cardoso, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, then president, created the first human rights program in Brazil. Human rights, new human rights institutions. And uh, this was accompanied, as many know, uh, by neoliberal reforms, privatization, and um, 
increasing inequalities. In the 2000s, under the Lula government, we could see the continuation of the neoliberal policies, but at the same time, uh, some space created an institutional reforms for the promotion of human rights uh, and progressive human rights policies and significant human rights uh, reforms. For example, affirmative, affirmative action programs at higher education, same-sex marriage was passed, was approved by the Supreme Court, um, and some uh, social programs like Bolsa Familia, and so there were some important change. This is, in my view, created a reaction. Not that the reaction in itself is new, or it's only a reaction. Uh, and, and that's the second, um, second perspective that I identify. Human rights as a force, or using the liberal approach as an image to justify a state of exception. And I think the government tenure is a good example. Uh, depoliticizing the death of Marielle to defend more military intervention in the name of the war on drugs and to control violence with more violence. So clearly there is a hidden interest on, this, on the part of the state, multiple interests in a political use of human rights against human rights. Then the third position is a clearly against human rights position, the fascist politics against human rights. Jair Bolsonaro was the only pre-candidate of the 2018 election in Brazil this week who did not make any comments on the killing of Maria Lefran. This politician and his followers view human rights as uh, uh, against uh, the, the uh, as, as a problem, basically. They defend less rights for those they don't see as human, the criminal, the poor, the people of color, the LGBT people. They react against the recognition of human rights, affirmative action programs, and etc. They defend summary, summary executions, in short, the extermination of the other. In the past week, reactionary movements against human rights have been creating fake news on, in social, on social media about Maria Franco, just to give an example, and trying to, uh, to kill now her reputation. Uh, these reactionary politics of human rights have also, has also appropriated the language of human rights against human rights, especially focusing on freedom of expression and equality um, and, uh, and trying to dismantle all uh, kinds of uh, laws and policies on, for example, uh, uh, women's rights and uh, based on a so-called ideology of gender that was uh, fabricated by the Catholic Church in the 1990s and uh, now is being used by conservative sectors of the Catholic of, uh, and Evangelical Church and uh, civil society uh, groups uh, at large. Uh, finally, the last uh, human rights perspective is a critical post-colonial and intersectional approach to human rights. That's the more radical approach that is trying to that use also human rights law and the state like Mariela was doing fighting for human rights from within the state um, and this is a very diverse field of movements communities and NGOs including struggles for collective rights centered on land rights territory um, and uh, challenging uh, the, the legacy of colonialism, capitalism, racism, sexism that uh, dominates the region, the Americas. And also includes the struggles over the existence, uh, the integrity, the autonomy of individual bodies. Um, so it's a very diverse field with feminist movements, 
anti-racism movements, LGBT movements, indigenous, Kilobolas, and etc. My approach to him, how can we mobilize human rights against reactionary politics of human rights? Can we use the law in this context? As we could see, this leader has just been assassinated. Is, is it possible? First, I wanted to clarify my approach. I view human rights as not only uh, norm, a norm or uh, what's uh, established by the law, but that is also what we can uh, understand by human rights. And the law is a language, but it's also an instrument and it also express multiple cultures on human rights. Then we have multiple cultures on human rights and practice of human rights, including talks about human rights like those I have illustrated. Um, human rights uh, should be conceived of, in my view, as indivisible, civil, political, social, economic, uh, environmental rights are inseparable, and um, the, the struggle for recognition of human rights subjects is not separated, cannot be separated from redistribution. Even when we talk about LGBT rights, we need to redistribute the resources uh, to promote, for example, public policies. This requires redistribution, uh, educational uh, policies as well. Finally, the, the most uh, challenging um, approach to human rights should be taking into account intersectionality of race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, disability, in a post-colonial perspective also on human rights. To confront a reactionary politics of human rights, we need to support the radical intersectional and transnational struggles that have been carried out by the marginalized communities. And by we, I mean the intellectuals, the academics, who are most of the time not coming from those marginalized communities. Legal mobilization is one of the topics of my research, and I think it can be used, even in this very reactionary context, as one strategy or a tool for promoting or for fighting for human rights, even if it's in a defensive manner. Legal mobilization, as defined by Michael McCann, broadly refers to the translation of a claim into the language of rights. It includes different types of legal practice, such as litigation, campaigns for creating new laws or for the implementation of a law, legal education, both in schools and outside of schools, um, raising uh, consciousness, um, raising rights consciousness, and um, it can be, be individual, collective, inside the state, in the courts, or outside. But a radical mobilization for human rights must go beyond an individualistic approach to human rights. This is clearly um, um, shown by Bobby Tula Santos and Cesar Rodriguez Garavito in their call, or and also proposal for supporter <coughs> cosmopolitan legality. This means that the mobilization of human rights must combine, if it's a legal mobilization, both legal, illegal, and illegal <coughs> practice. It must combine both social and political mobilization. It has to go beyond the local scale of uh, human rights practice and make connections with transnational movements, social movements. Collective rights must be also emphasized in that struggle. And challenging systems of domination and subordination, such as capitalism, colonialism, and racism, and heteropatriarchy. Boventura Santos also offers a, an interesting approach that I think is useful and important for promoting human rights, the epistemologies of the South, uh, 
especially because human rights, as I said before, it's, it's a legal framework, but it's also uh, 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 representing ideas, knowledge, cultures. And so we need to engage in the knowledge, in the production of human rights as legal knowledge, uh, especially as legal knowledge. Um, I would like to illustrate some of the um, some of the use of transnational um, of international human rights law based on my research in the inter-American system. Um, so first, um, I, I call transnational legal activism the use of international human rights law to promote change in the state. Uh, to promote the cause of social movements, to reconstruct and enforce human rights norms, to, to promote also human rights cultures in a progressive manner. Uh, NGOs, human rights NGOs, as well as social movement actors and in Brazil and also in the Americas have used international human rights law in the inter-American system. That system includes a commission, a human rights commission, and also the court, a human rights court, the Inter-American Court. So I'm going to cite just a few cases. The first one, the Shukuru case, given that I mentioned Cacique Chicão, and also because this is a very uh, uh, important moment in the struggle of the Shukuru indigenous people. The Shukuru people uh, live in, in, in the northeast of Brazil. It includes more than 7,000 indigenous peoples. And um, they have been fighting for the legalization, for the recognition of their land uh, since the 1980s. And um, in 1989, that's when the process of demarcation, right a year after the Brazilian Constitution was enacted, record granting uh, indigenous rights to, uh, to indigenous peoples in Brazil. Um, that's when the process of demarcation and legalization of their land was initiated. At that time, until the 80s, uh, indigenous people were viewed as non-existent in the northeast of Brazil. They were considered uh, decimated, but they existed and they were there surviving and resisting. Uh, they also fought, uh, were fighting for the recognition of their rights during the uh, establishment, the writing of the Brazilian constitution. In fact, the cacique Chicão, the leader of the Xucuru people, was one of the main leaders in the region. And, um, he um, was um, executed, assassinated, precisely because of that, uh, in, uh, 10 years later. His son became the cacique, and they used a different strategies to reclaim their land. One of them, similar to the landless workers movement, occupying the land, or reoccupying the land, and fighting for their rights, also using the law and the uh, popular legal uh, advocates uh, in, in the northeast of Brazil. Uh, but violence continued on. After the killing of Chicão, other indigenous leaders from the Chukuru people were also assassinated in this struggle for the recognition of their land. Uh, the demarcation has not been finalized yet. At the same time, um, not too long ago, on March 21st, uh, the uh, Inter-American uh, Court of Human Rights just decided found Brazil guilty of not demarcating and protecting the lives of indigenous people, of the Shukuru people. I have followed this case very closely and wrote an article about it. First I wrote in Portuguese and published there in the city uh, with the organization that was uh, uh, 
defending the rights of the Shukuru in the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Uh, then later, I translated because it was better for them to have the article published in English, actually. And I initially thought that writing in Portuguese was better because they could read. But then I realized that later that for their cause it was more important to make this article uh, uh, available in English, to pressure the courts to help their case. Actually, they went, oh, they had to face not only physical violence, but also the criminalization of the struggles. The cacique, uh, the son of cacique Chicano, uh, was actually found guilty by a criminal <coughs> in Brazil. And he was not uh, in jail because he was uh, protected by a program on human rights. Uh, so that uh, you can imagine how difficult it is, uh, this is struggle. In any case, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, uh, as I said last week, uh, uh, very recently decided, it, it's not March, I'm sorry, it's February, mm -hmm. decided that um, the, the Brazilian state has to uh, not only um, take the, um, those who invaded the land will have to be removed and receive indemnization preparation for the, uh, what, how they have built uh, things on their land. And at the same time, the Brazilian state will have to pay $1 million to the indigenous community. So this is one of the results of the case. Um, another important case is the Maria da Penha case. The Maria da Penha case, I also followed that case very closely, interviewing Maria da Penha. And that was initiated in 1998 in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Maria da Penha was a survivor of domestic violence. She became paraplegic as a result of two attempted murders by her former husband. And the case was decided by the Inter-American Commission in 2001. Until then, the Brazilian state, she was fighting for justice for almost 20 years in the Brazilian courts. The admissibility report, which is technically not like a judicial decision, so it cannot be enforced, but it had a political, an important political uh, symbolic force. And it helped feminist activists, NGOs, to promote a legal campaign to create a new, a new legislation on domestic violence against women in Brazil. The campaign was carried out from 2003 to 2006 in the context of more, more, um, uh, of, of a political context that was more uh, open to absorb, to incorporate the demands of the feminist movement. So the Maria da Penha law was then enacted in 2006, but the struggles for the implementation of this law continues on. And right now there are over 60 uh, proposals in Congress to change the law and there are many attempts to undermine, to subvert the, uh, the spirit of the law, the letter of the law. I, I, I will now cite another case. There are several cases, but I will uh, add one more. The other case is on racial discrimination against women. It's a case where a woman, Simone Diniz, the case was initiated in the commission in 1997, and it was initiated by human rights organizations, also the subcommittee of human rights of blacks at the Sao Paulo Bar Association. And she was discriminated against in the workplace as a, a domestic worker uh, who was looking for a job, and the employer had placed an ad in the newspaper looking for a woman with good appearance. And that means white in Brazil. So this is racial discrimination and the commission found 
that Brazil was responsible for the allegations, but again, that was not a judicial decision. She received a preparation and there was some impact in terms of creating some programs in Sao Paulo in this, where the violation took place. Now, I'm citing these examples and it appears like transnational legal mobilization is very successful, but it's not, it's very limited uh, because of course a state ignores and the force of human rights law is very limited. At the same time, Black women's organizations are using the inter-American system, like for example, Geledes and Viola from Sao Paulo and Rio, also to mobilize the system to pressure the Brazilian state, not only to, uh, to repair violations of human rights, but also to ratify um, a treaty, uh, in particular, uh, a treaty uh, on racial discrimination and racism, all forms of racial discrimination, the Inter-American Convention, to be more precise, against racism and all forms of discrimination and intolerance. So they are now uh, mobilizing. They have sent a report titled um, The Situation of the Human Rights of Black Women in Brazil, Violence and Violations, uh, in 2016, they sent a report to the Rapporteur on Women's Rights and the Rights of Afro-Descendant Peoples uh, and uh, Margaret McCauley, who is also a commissioner in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and she visited Brazil and met with black women uh, to hear her, their uh, complaints and, um, and then try to pressure the Brazilian state. Um, now, again, these are important um, actions, but very limited, especially in this context of so much violence and where the state is uh, occupied by uh, the more and more conservative forces. So there. Are, it's necessary, of course, to create other strategies, and they have created other strategies. Um, the protests, the ongoing protests that are taking place in Brazil right now as a result of the execution of Maria de Franco is a good example. And this will spark new movements as well. Um, poetry. Conceição Evaristo, a Brazilian, Afro-Brazilian writer, award winner, wrote a beautiful poem in honor of Mariela Franco, and so did uh, Maria Teresa Walter in Portugal. So poetry and the force of movies and uh, arts and music, very important uh, uh, to, uh, to continue these struggles and to make connections. The Black Lives Matter movement also published uh, a note about Mariela, uh, but the threat to human rights defenders is a real issue. Brazil ranks first in the Americas with respect to the killing of human rights defenders, according to Amnesty International. Between January and August of 2017, Amnesty reports that 58 human rights defenders <coughs> were assassinated in Brazil. Most of them were defending land and environmental rights, and were indigenous leaders and landless rural workers. So we currently face very little political opportunities to mobilize human rights from within the state. To conclude, I just would like to mention my final uh, ideas about uh, the possibilities and the limitations for mobilizing for human rights. A radical politics of human rights in the state can lead to the execution of community leaders. Uh, it's very dangerous, if not almost impossible. Law, on the other hand, is not the only language of human rights, but it is important to mobilize international human rights institutions to confront reactionary politics of human rights, at least a symbolic um, response may be achieved. It takes a long time, on the other hand. 
um, and it's a defensive strategy. Human rights mobilization must take multiple scales of action and coalitions between different communities of struggles is crucial. Um, the liberal human rights advocates may serve as political allies, and I think we need to count on them whenever possible, and an intersectional and post-colonial approach to human rights is necessary. But the challenge, in my view, is how to exchange knowledge on diverse struggles that sometimes are contradictory. And class struggles are not always the, uh, the issue the, the, the of concern of the LGBT movement, for example. And so these are important um, coalitions, and we need to learn about each other's histories and language. As Spivak has written long ago, um, and also building on uh, the feminists of power in the Americas, it's necessary to confront both oppression and privilege, and to question our own positions of privilege. I think these are steps, necessary steps, to form broad coalitions also between the universities and the, the communities, the marginalized communities that are fighting for human rights. Thank you.